Okay, y'all, I have 6.30 now, so we'll go ahead and jump in here. Um, I feel a little bit handicapped here because I can't see everybody in all parts of my screen, so I'm not even sure how many people we have on. But I did see Darby log on, so I made her co-host a few minutes ago, my friend and colleague in Giles County. So she's going to kind of man that chat box for us tonight. And as always, make sure you put any questions in there, and I'll make sure to pull those out and synthesize them and get those shared back out to everyone tomorrow. Um, any comments you have about anything as I move through the presentation, feel free to share um, those, those as well, because we're all here to just kind of learn from one another. Um, that being said, tonight's presentation is pretty lengthy. I'm sitting here looking at 360 slides, so we're obviously not going to get through like all of those. And some of these I'm going to zip through pretty quickly, uh, but you're going to have this as a reference with all the notes embedded in it. Um, plus, um, this is kind of a combination of three different presentations, and I kind of did some of these a little bit separate, more in depth last year, and I'm going to share those links with you as well. But I wanted tonight to kind of serve as a refresher as we start moving into May and spring planting time. And for those that did make the tomato talk, you know that we spent some time there at the end talking about uh, specific abiotic and bi uh, embiotic um, diseases and issues, um, things that you're probably very liable to see as we move through the growing season. So that's kind of what tonight is about to kind of serve as a refresher and talk about some of the chemicals uh, both organic and um, conventional that we can utilize kind of in our toolbox. So again, we're going to talk more about those type things kind of midway through the presentation. So we're going to start out with diseases and then IPM and then finish up with some insects, if that makes sense. So again, it's going to be really quick. So buckle up and we'll get to moving through this um, pretty quickly. Maybe if I can get my screen to advance here. Okay. There we go. So um, as we're talking about plant pathology, we're going to talk about two pretty specific types here, the non-living or abiotic issues plus the living or the biotic issues. And you can kind of see how that's broken out. Of course, anything that's abiotic, a lot of times going, um, I always say mother nature plays a big part in that. Uh, but oftentimes we'll see some type of injury from some of these listed on the left. Um, frost being one that's uh, I think probably going to happen a little bit later this week. Um, drought type issues, anything to do with soil pH. Um, and then, of course, the biotic or the living diseases are those that you see on the right. And we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about those in depth. Um, just to kind of throw this back up there about the disease triangle, we always have to have a plant um, pest or pathogen. We have to have a host and an environment in order for a disease to occur. And you can kind of see if we slice that triangle in two, it just means that we've kind of reduced the environment. So that's a, a component of integrated pest management, which is something we'll talk about here in a few minutes. Um, but even if we're utilizing um, resistant varieties, that's something that can help uh, reduce parts or slices of this triangle and make um, disease pathogens a little bit less frequent throughout the season. Um, just uh, really quickly, uh, as far as why we care, because obviously um, any of these, abiotic or biotic, are going to reduce um, anything that we're producing in our gardens or landscape. So just right out of the bat, we're going to talk about some of these abiotic issues. And again, you see there flooding, drought, freeze injury, pesticides. But some of the most popular are going to be sun scald. Um, this is one sometimes folks will bring in thinking that it's a disease issue, uh, but this is going to be directly related to the foliage or the canopy of the plants, depending on how you're, you're staking uh, fruit, or this is not only going to be on tomatoes, this can be on pretty much anything that you're growing um, in your garden, but anytime that uh, fruit's going to be exposed to the sun, it can uh, become white, kind of tan, almost a leathery feel on the surface where it's been exposed. We'll often get asked if you can still um, eat these fruits and, and you can. Um, it's just a little bit tougher on the inside so sometimes you'd want to cut that core out a little bit. Um, and often uh, again this is going to be directly related to, to just the, the foliage. If the defoliation is an issue because of some other disease then that's what we would want to control first. And you can kind of see there just on the pepper it's going to look the same. 
Often probably some of you have bought peppers at the store that have a little spot like this on it. Um, you can just cut that little central core out there and it's still edible. You can see it on eggplants here and cucumbers. Pretty common phenomena. Uh, we did talk about cat facing a few weeks ago, but those that missed the tomato class, I just want to kind of show what this looks like. Um, this is directly related to poor pollination. Um, that can be um, fluctuations in temperature, the temperature being way too hot at night for an extended period of time. If we get into a period of lower temperatures early in the season, like um, right after we plant or if that soil temp's not hot enough, um, anytime before those flowers are mature, if that temperature kind of stays low, then this can also occur. Uh, we are often going to see this too um, if we have some type of phenoxy herbicide, which would be like a 2,4-D injury. So even if you yourself are not spraying, um, you can have some residual carryover from a neighbor or something like that that can drift on. So anytime you see this, kind of investigate and kind of figure out maybe where this issue could be. Um, be arising. Uh, just another word of caution when you see this kind of phenomena, um, anytime that you prune or if you add nitrogen fertility to this, it's going to increase this occurrence and make it a little bit worse. So keep that in mind. And then you can just kind of see some different pictures of this. This is also going to be more prevalent, as you can see here, from our heirloom tomatoes. Same thing with cracking. Um, and I showed you all this a, a few weeks ago too. Uh, the, the fruit, once it's set to its certain size, it stops growing. If you don't get that harvested in time, then of course when we pick that, we end up with that fruit skin expanding. And I'm using tomatoes primarily here, but again, kind of like I showed you with sun scald, this can happen with a lot of our, our veggies in the garden. And even at, on this smallest scale, um, you can see this, but the reason that it's an issue is because once we do get something that looks like this, um, it can open us up to some type of secondary fungal infection or even insects. It draws those in, which can become a bigger problem. So that's why it's really important to just go ahead and get harvested when everything's ripe. Um, this is what peppers will look like later in the season, and they'll almost get like leathery feeling, but again, that's just going to be that uh, physiological issue and even carrots will do that and you can see cabbages will do that as well. Blossom end rot, a lot of folks are going to associate that with um, calcium fluctuations but a lot of that's going to be tied more directly um, to moisture fluctuations in the soil. It's a little bit more complicated than just calcium deficiency. Um, let me get to a picture here so you can kind of see what that looks like. And again, this is going to occur on multiple fruits. We're going to see this on tomatoes, peppers, um, eggplants, especially the solanaceous crops. So one of the things is um, as calcium, um, well, calcium is always taken up constantly by those plant roots. And then it's just going to be uh, dissolved and then it travels to those growing points. So new leaves and shoots are going to see this issue and phenomenon first on the plant. You can kind of see what that looks like once it's scarred over. Again, if we're severely pruning these plants, it's going to increase the occurrence of this happening. And then you can see that's a Roma plant there. Also on squash, it's not going to just be solanaceous crops. So if you've ever had this, um, some, some folks will think that this is like a pollination, but often that's going to be tied directly again um, to those moisture fluctuations. And then the reason that we harp on soil pH, and y'all have probably seen me show this um, before, but once we get to a lower pH that, that you see there, the 5.2 or the 5.5, you see what happens in, within that root zone. So that's why it's so critical to have a pH of 6.5 because those roots are going to be able to fan out, go deep, and actually access some of those secondary nutrients like the calcium. So anytime that our pH is not right, like you can see here, it's going to either cause some deficiencies or some toxicities um, in our plants. And this is where blossom end rock does in fact come into play. You can see here from watermelons, and then also peppers. Now here's another one that we get a lot of questions on each year. 
um, not really a specific name for it. We just call it internal white tissue. And you can see they're slicing into that tomato and sometimes you'll even have seeds um, that germinate on the inside of that tomato or sometimes you'll even have those seeds germinate like on the outside of that tomato. This is just a physiological um, a pheno a phenomenon. You're not going to really see any symptoms um, on the outside of that fruit. You're really not going to know that you even have this until you cut into it. So typically when we see this is when we spike temperatures right during the ripening period. So anytime that we um, get those sustained temperatures for more than a couple of days, we're, we're more liable um, to see this. And of course, anytime that we're um, adding more nitrogen to those plants, this is also going to increase that occurrence. You can eat these tomatoes, just maybe cutting out um, the parts that are affected. This is leaf curl. Uh, you're going to have a lot of different things that can call leaf, uh, cause leaf curl. Sometimes it's going to be normal depending on the type of plant. Um, you can also just have environmental stress. Again, if you get out there and you plant in the soil right now too early, this is going to be one of the first signs that they will exhibit. So the plant's going to let you know, whoops, it's a little cold out here for me right now. Um, anytime we get a viral infection, we'll often have curling of the leaves. And then again with herbicide damage. So when you see this, typically it's going to be one of those specific um, occurrences that's going to cause that. And then just to show you some pictures of herbicide injury. And this is going, it's, it's going to look very similar depending on the types of herbicides. So phenoxy herbicides like 2,4-D, some of those amino pyrrolids which are used on pastures, um, maybe sprayed in fence rows. Um, all of these have the potential to drift and can cause this leathery or not leathery, rubbery filling on the stem. It kind of thickens and enlarges that stem and then we get substantial leaf curl and twisting of that plant. And you can kind of see what that looks like here. Um, it's very tough to the touch. And of course, uptake from residue or drift, either one of those is going to be problematic because that material is going to be moving systemically through the plant. So it's really sad when a plant gets to this stage and you actually have blossoms, um, but it's probably best to go ahead and remove that plant because it's severely going to stunt that plant back if, if not killing it um, in the process, depending on how bad the drift was. Sometimes if, uh, depending on specific chemicals, you'll have this leaf ble uh, bleaching phenomena that can also occur. And you can kind of see what that spittle looks like. Um, this could be, um, I know this happens with, with farmers that'll sometimes follow maybe tobacco crops or other agronomic crops with a vegetable garden, even a year or two after the fact, and you still have some of that herbicide left in the soil and we get that splash up factor. So that's kind of what we're, we're seeing here. Anytime that you might use a pre-emerge in your garden, um, this can be a symptom of what that looks like. Now, as far as living pathogens, uh, we've got four different ones. Uh, we have nematodes. Let me see if I can get my pointer out here. Nematodes, viruses, the fungi, which are not always fun to deal with, and then your bacterias. And just some slides in here. Uh, for fun, we're going to skip over this because I want to spend more time talking about some of these pathogens. But you have these in here um, to kind of serve as a, as a reminder. The big thing with, with fungi is just knowing that they reproduce by spores or sclerotia or we'll have these vegetative structures like the hyphae that we see here. And I showed you those a couple weeks ago with tomatoes, especially um, with southern blight. Anytime we see something like this, then this is a sketchy character and we want to stay away or we want to, we want to eradicate that, as, um, pull those plants, get that out of there and start taking steps to uh, revitalize that soil for production several years on down the pike. Um, sclerotia, a lot of times, if you've ever called into an extension office, um, especially um, for maybe Leyland cypress, we'll ask you if there's sclerotia on the branches. Um, and that's what these are, are right here, these little fruiting bodies. So um, these are the ones that typically reproduce early in the morning. There's a narrow window in which they actually reproduce and kind of flow forth from these bodies. And that's kind of, they disperse themselves by wind and water. So water, again, can be 
um, not just rainfall or any time that you're irrigating, but it can also be heavy dews, heavy fogs, and even high humidity. So a lot of times when we speak to these fungal organisms, it's not just going to be rainwater. But when, you know, that it does cause us concern. So that's one reason, like for early blight, if y'all report that to your extension offices, um, most of us are kind of connected and we let our um, clientele know so they can start making preventative sprays to kind of prevent um, some of those symptoms from coming into the garden. And again, uh, we're going to go through some of these. Uh, one thing right now, just to kind of mention, if you are buying transplants in the next month or so, damping off can be an issue. And I might have a picture down here. Y'all are blocking it, so I can't really see this very good. But just to make mention of that, when you do purchase transplants, and y'all have heard me say this before, pop those out and, and kind of look at the root system. You want the roots to be tidy, neat, and white. You don't want no brown sliminess. And then always look at the stem or at the soil level where that stem emerges from that pot, no matter what kind of plant it is. That damping off will sometimes be kind of slick and snotty looking for lack of a better word. Plus you'll have a lesion. And sometimes you might have to dig into the soil to look, but look around that stem, the base of that plant to make sure you don't see any of those type lesions. Because if you take that plant home with you and put it in your garden, then you're also carrying that pathogen with you. So just be careful with that. And I'm gonna skip over some of these, but again, if studying mycelium and some of these type things interest you, then I put all this in here for you. But you can see all the different kinds of pathogens. Um, if there's something, especially when it comes to like the southern blight, something that we, that is very, very devastating, uh, we will send that to the lab and this is kind of what those are going to scope. That's what those are going to look like. Sometimes we can do that in our offices. But typically if it's something like alternaria, which is early blight, or septoria, which we're going to talk about in a few minutes, uh, we're going to treat those the same. And we can usually just look at that um, when you bring that sample in and kind of identify and get you moving in the right direction. A couple to speak to, and I guess I've already talked about this, the damping off, uh, Pythium or Phytophthora root rot, either one. Um, this is going to be found in the soil or even media, soil media. So um, anytime we get warm and humid conditions, which greenhouse is the perfect environment for that, then we're going to see some of these issues um, occur. And you can kind of see how that stem, of course, it's kind of sunken in. You can see that lesion right here. And you can kind of see what that looks like down here at the base. And there's going to be different fungal organisms that are going to cause different types of damping off. So a rhizoc would typically be here. And those little sclerotia I was talking about earlier, it looks like a little rat poop, um, will usually be right at the soil line. So that's another thing that you can look for to make sure you're not taking um, any kind of disease home with you. And then seeds will also be infected or can be infected with some of these pathogens. Um, that's not going to be anything on, on your part, uh, but that's why we always say if you're saving seed, make sure they're seed that can be saved. Or if you're purchasing, make sure they're certified disease-free seed. Um, that's really going to help on that clean seed. Um, but you can kind of see there again what these little seedlings look like. Here's some of the lesions on the stem. That gives you a little bit better idea what that's going to look like. You can see that this is kind of an older uh, lesion that's kind of healed over, but you're still going to have issues from that when you take it home and plant it. And again, that's just that can be rhizoc and pythium. We're going to have different um, inoculum that's going to cause kind of the same type of issues. And you'll hear it damping off, stem rot, um, root rot, stem cankers, and then we even call it brown patch and turf. So lots of different names that it can go by. So we're kind of spending some time on this because again, these can be such an issue and it can prevent a lot of uh, trouble just kind of investigating those plants early on. But you can kind of see what that's going to look like. And it's just going to cause further issues. And there's not really anything at this point that we can do. That's why it's all beginning with um, healthy transplants. And then if we do get to the fruit, this is going to be caused by rhizox. So sometimes we'll see this that's coming from the soil. Um, this is still going to be edible, so don't worry about that. Oftentimes you'll hear us refer back to this as belly rot. 
but that's still going to be a fungal pathogen, just an FYI, but we have these different names um, in one of the charts resources that I've given you, it's going to kind of spell that out for you. So you can see some of those different names, uh, plus the, the scientific name as well, the actual pathogen. But yes, this is the biggie. Anytime we see this, we, we, don't, we don't want to take a transplant like that home. Uh, and this is actually a poinsettia plant, but it's a nice shot of what those cankers look like. Now, Alternaria, um, this again is the organism that's going to cause early blight in tomatoes, but it's going to cause many different issues with all of our veggie plants. So any type of leaf spot or leaf blight um, is often going to be caused by Alternaria. We like to refer to this as the opportunistic um, pathogen because you've got about 380 species of plants are going to be affected by this. Um, water is going to be one of the carriers, the heavy carrier for this disease, disease development, so keep that in mind. Um, and this is one that's going to spread again by little spores called, well, it's canidia is what it's spelled or said. Um, this is um, what this is going to look like on cabbages or broccoli or cauliflower. So anytime you see this phenomenon going on, um, then we know that's going to be related directly back to alternaria. And you can see there on um, cucurbit leaves what that looks like. And of course, again, this is where integrated pest management comes into play because a lot um, of this is going to be prevention related. Um, this is where um, resistant cultivars are going to come into play. This is where um, that soil health maintaining um, proper N, P, and K in the soil because uh, potassium can actually if we don't have adequate levels of potassium can actually increase this occurrence. Uh, we want to make sure that we're spacing plants appropriately so we get enough ventilation and airflow through those plants. Crop rotation, y'all hear me harp on that all the time. That's really going to be important. And then mulching, um, whether that be with a living um, ground cut or living cover crop or whether it be just with typical mulch of some um, sort. Now, again, remember that this one is going to be carried more by water. So that's another reason that we'll harp all the time on not overwatering. We don't want that foliage to get wet because that just opens up this huge breeding ground for these spores to multiply. So if there's some way you can get a drip or some type of trip, trickle irrigation in your garden, that's going to work wonders. But that's also why mulch plays such an important role because we're keeping those soil uh, temperatures consistent and we're keeping moisture uh, levels consistent. Um, so if we get started out of the gate right, it's really going to help um, reduce this occurrence. Just a few more pictures to kind of show what that looks like. And you're going to get those target spots. This one's kind of hard to see right here, but it does have that target. Um, they start kind of coalescing like you see in these pictures. And then we just severely reduce our leaf surface to uh, create and make uh, photosynthesis for food. But you can see that target uh, right there a little bit better, especially on this tomato stem. And that's the other key, you know, I showed you that picture of the cabbage. So you're going to have it on the fruit. You can have these spots or lesions on the stems or on the leaf surface. So it's going to show up anywhere on that plant. It's going to look very uh, similar to this. The key to these, um, anything with the alternaria is to be on, out, on the lookout early. Um, I'm not sure if that's where early black gets its name because it can actually show up later in the season as well, but um, just be on the lookout early. And then remember that protective sprays are going to be best because a curative is not really in the books for this. So it's all about um, using those integrated pest management strategies, those cultural controls I was just talking about and then spray in some kind of preventative on there. And if you're growing organic, it's gonna be hard to achieve that. If you're doing conventional, we do have some sprays that, that can achieve that. Just some more pictures to kind of show you what that looks like when those leaves coalesce. Um, it, this is one that's gonna start at the bottom of the plant and it's gonna work its way up. This is on any plant. So that's another indicator. So you're gonna be out there, you know, um, the investigative sleuth checking this out. So that's another way that you know that's going to going to um, act and it's going to move really, really fast. I don't know what my slideshows are doing here. But. Okay, so powdery mildew. Um, this is another fungal pathogen 
you can kind of see what that looks like. It looks like you've uh, taken baby powder or flour and kind of sprinkled. Uh, the leaves will be covered in this white coating. Sometimes you'll have these circular spots. That's a really bad infection there. Um, anytime we get in temperatures of 60 to 80 degrees, hello, um, that's where this pathogen is really going to thrive. So uh, most of the time earlier in the season or later in the season when the temperatures are not really, really hot. And if you have any shade in your garden, this is one that's going to thrive in the shade. And shade's not just, you know, your trees. Um, the shade can also be having your plants too close together. Here's just a picture of what the powdery versus downy looks like. We're going to talk about downy next. Um, but powdery is going to have that powdery fuzz, whereas downy is going to, you're going to have these yellow lesions on the bottom. And let's go into looking at some more of these. So you're going to see it speckled up a little bit more. And oftentimes, if you look on the underside of this leaf, is where you're going to find more of the spore casings for this. And anytime we get moisture that kind of splashes up onto the plants, um, that's going to help move those spores even more. It's going to disperse those even more. So again, that's another reason um, integrated pest management, why mulching would be so critical. And again, just to see the lesion. So that's what you're going to see from the top. You're not going to get that powdery um, surface looking down on this, but if you look on the underside of the leaf, that's where you're going to see that with the downy. And then this is what it's going to look like as it um, an, a little bit older infection because once those spores get onto the leaf, you can see how they just kind of start colonizing. And then that mycelia just keeps spreading on the leaf surface. And then you can also see here in basil, uh, and this has become a really bad issue with um, basil and impatience in the last few years. So really seek out those resistant cultivars to kind of reduce the occurrence of this. Um, cuc cucumbers can also have a similar occurrence with young um, fruit if you don't get those on a, on a trellis. So that's why airflow is going to be one of the most critical things to alleviate any symptoms of both um, powdery and downy mildew. Septoria, I should have put this one close to Alternaria because they're going to look very, very similar. So again, those of you in the tomato class saw this a couple weeks ago. Um, more often than not, both of those are going to occur together. So we don't always really try to differentiate, but you can kind of tell the difference. These are going to be more of like little speckle pencil size holes on the leaf. Uh, you do get the coalescence, but you get more of like a little halo and you don't have the target that you actually see. It doesn't have the bullseye effect like the early blight does, but it's still going to cause the same type issue. You can kind of see the difference there. You can actually see that what we call the smig, I can't ever say that word, uh, sphygmidia instead of the target or the bullseye like we see in Alternaria, this is what it's going to look like on the Septoria. So this is just blowed up of that. And then here's the picture that shows that a little bit better. We're going to tell you to treat both of those the same, Alternaria Early Blight and Septoria, because they're going to occur and appear about the same time. So you can see here kind of how they do look very um, similar. As far as anthracnose, um, this is going to be another that kind of looks like Alternaria. You're going to get those sunken dark spots. So it's going to look similar to even sun scald that I showed you a little bit earlier. Um, but sometimes you're going to have this is the differentiation, this little salmon colored circle. And that's actually where those spores are residing. And again, water is going to be the carrier on this. But again, you can kind of see that pink coral or salmon color that's uh, emerging on the fruit here. And then even on some of our pumpkins, you have to kind of look close because of that color, but you're still kind of seeing what that issue looks like. And this is also going to be prevalent in um, winter squash um, as well. So anytime we get that sunken black ring and that little salmon colored halo, then that's, that's going to tell us we need to start treating. And then this is on spinach. So you can tell it has no um, confines as to what it affects. And again, we get the sunken lesions here. 
and this can overwinter. So that's another reason you hear me harping a lot um, later in September, October, whatever, about cleaning up y'all's gardens and sanitizing everything, putting everything to bed for winter, because so many of these pathogens will in fact overwinter. But we'll talk about that later, but just know that it can overwinter in seed, soil, and plant residue. Here, this one's really pretty. Pretty ugly looking, ain't it? But you can kind of see how this would be confused with other diseases. But this is going to be your anthracnose. And again, it's one that can show up on the stems. But rather than that bullseye like the alternaria, you're going to get more of that salmon, rusty, tan colored splotches on the, on the lesion. So salmon color or coral color, pink color is what's going to kind of differentiate anthracnose from alternaria. And then Botrytis, this is one probably um, everybody is familiar with. We see this even in grocery store berries that we purchase. So this is going to be one that's going to thrive in these cooler, moister conditions. So early spring right now as we go to picking these berries. But you can also see there from the inset with raspberries that it can be an issue. Um, we often say in greenhouse or high tunnel management that if we see this, it's usually an indicator of bad management. So again, anytime you hear those words, that triggers to think integrated pest management and doing uh, or incorporating a lot of those or um, organic control measures, cultural control measures um, before this becomes a problem. So this picture I like because it shows that straw mulch as a bedding. Um, you know, we don't ever want strawberry fruit, especially to be lying flat on the ground because the soil can be um, so full of pathogens or just the splash up effect that can can be a major issue. And you can see what that looks like too on our um, grapes and gray mold um, is usually a pretty heavy um, infestation and we can lose a lot of fruit to this every, every year, especially if we get into a wet year. And we've had that occur sometimes. Um, anytime we get into like a week of overcast skies and just overall dreariness, we're gonna see this a little bit more. Also on onions, and again, this is something we've seen probably at the grocery store, but you can see that what we call that tan mycelium here. It starts shedding its outer skin. You can see that fuzzy growth there. Again, this is um, Botrytis, this right here. If we, if we were to leave this tomato in our gardens and not do anything with that, then that's going to live in that soil and it's going to thrive through the winter time and it's going to come back and be a, a major issue for us uh, for years to come. So anytime we see these type of issues, uh, remove those. Um, anytime it's diseased, make sure, you know, we're not necessarily putting that in a compost pile. We don't want to, you know, continue um, letting those diseases thrive on the compost, even though we heat that up at, you know, pretty high temperatures. But anytime we get a major outbreak or something like this, remove all of that debris um, and just burn that material. That's the best way to get rid of those spores. Kind of see a difference there. So you can see a lot of these are going to look very similar, but if you take those in and, and show an extension agent or send a picture, um, nine times out of, out of ten they're going to be able to look at these pictures and be like, yeah, this is, this is what this is. This is what you need to do. They might ask you a few questions to kind of make sure that their thinking is um, correct, that they're headed down the right path. Um, but again, when it comes to the fungi, making sure that we have resistant plants, uh, clean seed and stock, uh, cleaning equipment. I didn't really touch on that, but this is a huge component of integrated pest management. Um, even, this is when I wish I was with y'all, I would show you, I keep a, a box of those disposable booties, they're like plastic booties that I slip on over my shoes, just in case like I'm out at Cindy's farm or, you know, in her garden, and then I go to Teresa's farm, I don't want to be carrying any type pathogens from one place to the other. Or I don't want to necessarily carry, like if I've been on the research center and I'm coming home or vice versa, I don't want to carry any type, type pathogen. So if you're not sure, um, investing in a box of those is not a bad idea. But like your equipment, um, your tillers or anything like that, if you've had an issue, just be careful. Um, you know, make sure you're, that you're sanitizing anything that you're utilizing in your garden. That's really going to help us reduce the occurrence of some of these fungal organisms. Proper drainage and aeration. We don't want water standing in our garden areas. Um, we want to make sure that we're spacing those plants appropriately and then crop rotation. And this is something we'll talk on 
um, a little bit later in the year. But as far as chemical, just know those fungicides, and we'll speak to those here in a few minutes, but kind of get familiar, whether you're organic or conventional, know what works best on what. And um, I'm going to speak to this a little bit later too, but just so I don't forget, um, even wh or whatever chemical that we're utilizing, we want to rotate chemicals too. So you see their crop rotation, but we also want to rotate chemicals because that's how resistance occurs. So um, it might be that you're investing in a couple of different fungicides, but there's a purpose for that, not just to, to spend money and throw it to the wind. It actually is a good management tool to do that. Now, viral infections are a little bit more wonky. <laughs> They're not going to be actual living organisms. Um, and we all, well, I don't probably have to tell you all about virus because we've dealt with COVID-19 for the last year. So think about that. It's going to act kind of the same way in, um, in plants. We're going to get a lot of these viral sim symptoms like stunting and chlorosis, um, these really cool mosaic patterns. I think they're kind of cool looking, but you know, when I see that, I know that's a virus, um, no matter how cool looking it kind of looks. Um, any kind of ring spots, leaf distortion, any of those type issues are going to kind of lend themselves to being viral in nature. And anytime we get a virus, um, that's going to be really hard for us to control. Just like in us, you know, if it's a bacteria, we can take antibiotics. If it's a virus, they send you home to rest. So um, same thing with plants. And here's a good one to show you some of those weird color patterns, a little splotchiness, um, these really cool mosaics. So anytime that you think that uh, your tomatoes or your cucumbers or squash look like art, that's probably not a good sign. <laughs> so keep that in the back of your your mind. Uh, the biggest one I want to talk about is tomato spotted wilt virus. Uh, we could also talk about this in insects and it may be there. I just didn't take that out, but um, this is going to be vectored by thrips. So a little tiny plant or insect that you can't hardly see, but it's going to leave this um, speckling on the leaf. So almost looks like honeydew or sooty mold. And if you've ever seen maple trees or anything, um, where aphids are feeding that, and that nectar is left, it'll leave that black mold. So um, thrips are kind of going to do the same thing. Um, the thing with tomato spotted wilt virus is we've got about a thousand plant species that can actually get this, and it's going to be vectored again by that little teeny tiny incorrigible insect. And you can see some more pictures here. There's no treatment. So if we get this virus, you've got to control the thrips. So that's another thing about integrated pest management that we harp on is to identify the pest correctly. Because if you start throwing uh, fungicides and bactericides or anything like that at this, then we're not going to get control. That's why proper ID is critical because we're going to treat for the insect rather than the disease. But again, just kind of see that mosaic pattern there. You'll get some bronzing in the leaves. And I bet this is one that a lot of you, if you grow banana peppers, you may have seen this. So that's going to be tomato spotted wilt virus on those. Same with these peppers. Um, the only bad thing about even if we're going to treat for the thrips, it's really hard to do that because they move so frequently. Um, they move around pretty much uncontrollably. So it's going to be really hard to, to get adequate um, control. But if we're getting getting those caught early in the season before it progresses to this stage of growth, then we're going to fare a lot better. Real quickly, again, no chemical control. It's just all going to be about these integrated pest management strategies here. Notice resistant cultivars are at the top of all of those, clean seed and transplants, good sanitation, and then trying to control those vector populations. Now, another way that we can control this vector population Y'all would I'd probably never go shopping with me, but anytime, again, that I purchase plants, not only am I popping it out of that container to look at the roots, you know, investigating at the soil line, but I'm also going to be like moving my hand over those plants and see if I get any kind of movement from thrips or aphids, because I don't want to take those home with me. Um, and, and it's okay, pass over those. Even if they're the prettiest plants in the world, um, they're going to continue to cause you problems when you get home with them. So healthy transplant. Um, bacterial infections, these are kind of cool because they require a film of water to be able to infect whatever it is. So um, unlike fungi, they're actually going to be able to actively 
penetrate plant tissue. So um, this is what I was referring to earlier, like with cracking and cat facing. If we allow that fruit to stay out in our gardens, this is where bacteria can become an issue because they're just going to seep right in. And oftentimes we'll see those kind of go hand in hand. Kind of see there. Um, anytime that we drop um, maybe a sliver of a stem or something that we think is infected with a bacteria, uh, we can drop that in water and we'll see those striations occur. And that's one, right, one way that we know that it is in fact going to be a bacteria. You can actually see those colonizing kind of spreading out from that sample in the water. Uh, but you can see there insect vectors are going to be a big spread for that too. All of these are going to be really dependent upon management um, factors that you put into play right now to help kind of alleviate some of these issues. So again, all of those are IPM related. This is the leaf hopper, by the way. So uh, many of us that have oaks or, or our communities and our neighborhoods that have oak trees, um, bacterial scorch of oak trees is spread by this leaf hopper. And we've actually seen a lot of old, old oak trees have to come down as a result of this little critter here, because it's really small. This is blowed up, um, but really bad bug. Everybody's favorite, bacterial wilt. Now this one too is gonna be vectored by the stupid little cucumber beetles that were in massive quantities and populations last year. I cannot get control of this no matter what I try. Um, I'll go to bed with the prettiest cucumbers and wake up the next morning and this is what I've got or this is what I've got. And it looks like you've just gone out and, you know, dumped scalded water on my cucumber plants. So um, they are going to survive in the winters uh, because they actually um, live in the beetle's guts. So that bacteria is living through the insect through the winter and then they're coming back the next season and piercing um, the fruit or the leaf and just reinfecting all over again. You can see what a bad infection looks like there because seriously within a few days this is what, what we're going to get. Um, another way that we know it's bacterial, that milky oozy sap like I was talking about, just taking a little bit of that and dropping down in water and we'll see that uh, string out in water. So just another way to positively ID that. Um, if you see this, it's unfortunately probably best to just remove that entire plant and burn that entire plant. Uh, right here is the striped and the spotted. Both of these are going to cause the issue. Um, I don't know if I have a picture of the egg casings in here or not, but they're going to be like a, br a bronzy orange color and you'll see those on the tops of the leaves. Um, we want to avoid any kind of soil contact. So again, uh, those IPM practices coming into play here, growing those cucumbers up vertically or at least having some kind of mulch for those to grow on is going to reduce um, the, the habitat for some of those beetles as well. Kind of see the bug here again. And then they're going to go through many life cycles. So um, they're going to look like this from nymph to adult. They're just going to be much smaller. So you're going to see these emerging throughout the entire season. And then we have scab. Uh, this is going to be bacterial, but um, you can still eat these. A lot of people don't think you can, but they're completely edible. It's just more of an aesthetic issue. Um, anytime we get into a pH issue, again, with, with our soil and the potatoes, it can cause this to be a little bit um, worse. It is going to be a little bit more prevalent in drier soils. Um, you're going to see this occurrence more if you plant, and probably everybody's already planted potatoes, but if you plant when that soil is really wet, uh, we're going to see a higher occurrence of this as well. Um, anytime we get water, in the first couple weeks right after planting potatoes, we'll see our high, a higher occurrence of this. Again, um, certified seed is going to help reduce some of the occurrence of that too. But this, this is streptomyces. It's, what's, it's the pathogen that causes this. But remember, they're still edible. They just look ugly. And then we have bacterial soft rot. And you can kind of see what that. This one is one caused by Erwinia. And we usually will run, lump um, Rhizoc, Arwenia, and Pythium kind of all together, even though bacterial and fungal, because um, they're kind of going to look very similar in some of the symptoms. And you, 
of course, by the time you dig those carrots, you're not going to see that till it's already too late. Uh, but remember, again, farm tools can actually introduce this bacterium. So that's why disinfecting and always cleaning up that garden um, in the fall is going to help reduce a lot of these bacterial occurrences. And here is what it's going to look like in pepper. Um, you can use a bacteria side, and we'll talk about those in a few minutes. But you can usually see this, um, just the really soft, mushy, the mushy stem. That's going to be a, a dead giveaway. And we won't go into all of that, but they are going to uh, continually reproduce on that plant. So that's why we've got to remove that plant. It can be uh, pretty dangerous. So again, controlling those bacteria, it all goes back to integrated pest management. Um, nothing there I've not already talked about, but you notice that in, as far as chemical, we are going to have limited options, but you see antibiotics and then copper fungicides listed there. So if you grow fruit, then you know copper is one of your best friends in, in an orchard. So it's going to be the same thing with any of these bacterias. Um, it's often been said that copper can actually help stimulate the immune system, um, kind of turn it on and kind of give a little bit, um, a little bit, I don't want to say resistance, but it makes it more tolerant, if you will. And then uh, we've even heard from an organic front of people spraying whole milk. Uh, we used to do that in tobacco. I'm not sure in the, in the garden how effective that would be. Um, but just as an FYI, there's a link in here that you can explore that if that's something that interests you. So now we've, no. I had to put that in here about chopping down a fruit tree because I get frustrated sometimes like with the, the bacterial wilt in my cucumbers and I work so hard to try to alleviate all of these issues and I'm still just like, ah, oh, hitting my head. They're just winning, what do I do? So, you know, what do we do next? And I've already alluded to this because pest ID is going to be very, very critical. You know, we, we want to um, have that journal. Y'all hear me talk about that quite frequently. If, if this is your first time or your first few times being with me, uh, you'll hear me really harp on that because I think it's so critical to write everything down. Um, it gives us insight for what we can expect for the next year, and it gives us better preparation for what we can do better to be a little bit more successful, even in, in controlling these things. So it's just about kind of getting intimate with your garden. Uh, we're asking our questions here. Um, this is just kind of figuring out maybe where, where to start. These are questions I would ask you or any uh, extension agent would ask you, you know, we, we're going to want to know about the weather. Uh, we're going to try to see if it's physiological in nature because a lot of times when people bring in samples or send us pictures, it can be. And so then you're not going to need any type of chemical, you know, we, we're just going to kind of tell you some cultural type things to do. Uh, we're going to ask you about insect and insect damage figure out where you're at in the season timeline, uh, your location to kind of know where there might be some fungal pathogens nearby. Um, what about your soil health, any kind of fertility issues? Sometimes it can even be wildlife injury. So if you get these questions from me or anybody that you're, that you're asking about, these are just gonna be kind of typical. Um, this is something you can also jot down in your journal to kind of keep it, keep tabs on it. And, you know, it's just about kind of looking for clues. Again, it's looking for symptoms and signs, um, piecing together the big jigsaw puzzle. You know, anytime we see those fruiting bodies, then we know we're going to be dealing with a fungal issue. You know, anytime we see some, some kind of ooze, um, that's going to be related with bacteria. And a lot of this, hopefully, um, even tonight's talk or some of the other videos that we've done, you know, that's going to help you be a little bit more proactive in your own gardens this year. That's one reason I believe in trying to show this to everybody each year, because even me as a home gardener, I need it too, you know, so it just really helps to kind of have that re refresher. Uh, Prevention is always going to be the best line of defense. The more that we can be proactive, the better off we're going to be. So much better than being reactive because a lot of these diseases we just can't really um, control curatively. So you can kind of see the, um, the fungal spreading plant, so fungal diseases and bacteria. We're going to see usually um, that pathogen kind of slowly move through the plant and that's where we can actually remove the inoculum if we get it caught early enough. Why am I not advancing? Oh, okay, there it is. I can't see it. 
you can kind of see how those clusters just keep spreading. So like I say, if we can get it caught early enough, then we can control it. Viruses, on the other hand, they're going to spread systemically. So that makes them um, even more difficult to control. Again, just kind of liking it. I hate to keep saying COVID-19, but um, viruses are going to act very similar in plants like they do with us. So um, when they first enter a cell, they're going to be, begin spreading to these adjoining cells, and then they're going to move to the phloem. And remember, uh, phloem flows up, xylem, xylem flows up, phloem flows down, cambium layer goes round and round. So once they get into that phloem tissue, that's when it becomes systemic. Um, same thing like in, in us as humans, if, you know, the old, you know, they, something gets in their blood and they go septic. So it's, a, it's kind of the, the same type thing. So um, then from there, it gets into the roots and transported again back up into the plant. And you're going to see it first appear in those young leaves too. Um, vectors, of course, they're going to help spread a lot of these diseases, the aphids, leafhoppers, white flies. So getting control of those early in a greenhouse or just making sure that we're not Purchasing those plants is going to be key. And then enter in plant pest management, integrated pest management. Uh, we've talked a lot about these already, but cultural, biological, and chemical, all of these steps are going to help us get to where we want to be. Um, culturally, um, just eradicating, so that's in-season roguing. A lot of folks will go out and pick off the stink bugs. They'll pick off the potato bugs. Um, dunk them in soap water, whatever, but just making sure that we're roguing those pests. Or the plant, if it's the bacterial will of cucumbers, getting rid of that whole plant, as bad as it is to do that. Um, another cultural control is just pruning. Um, again, cleaning up the garden in the fall. Alternate host removal, and there's a really cool uh, publication in there. So we're talking about vegetable gardens, but remember that um, we have weed species that are going to be in the same family, so some of our veggies. So solanaceous, the nightshade or the belladonna, those weeds can also serve as a secondary host or an alternate host. So they might not be in your garden, but they're around and they can serve as that host site to bring those things into your, your garden. Crop rotation, tillage and sanitation, these are things, of course, we'll talk more about later in the year. Um, but just making sure we employ these tactics again, that's why that journal is so important. We want to um, avoid any um, introduction of some of these pathogens. So again, spacing those plants accordingly. Don't take squash and plant on this close, you know, to each other to have more zucchini or yellow squash. You're actually going to get less. Actually adequately space those out. You get good airflow. You're going to have better um, and adequate room for those crops to fruit. Um, when we're intercropping, um, we're actually, and y'all have heard me say this before, maybe like with companion planting, um, planting radishes underneath your tomatoes or in, in between your tomato plants and things like that. It confuses some of those um, insects but it can also kind of trap them, serve as a trap crop as well. Mulching, irrigation, and fertility, we've kind of touched on all those again. Just making sure we're not overhead watering is going to be a biggie. And I put this schematic in there for you. You can kind of see where that dew is going to come into play between 10 and 10. Um, you can see where not to water there. Oftentimes spore production or repro reproduction is going to take place in that window from like 4 to 6 a.m. Oops, I forgot the second part of my slide there. Um, again, disease resistance, making sure we, we purchase cultivars that are going to meet our needs. So what my issues are going to be, and I keep picking on Cindy because I see her here, but what my issues are going to be may not be what Cindy's dealing with. So we're going to have different types issues or what Teresa has going on or Kat. You know, Kat. We're all going to have these different issues. So what suits me may not suit y'all. So again, it's all about journaling, keeping up with that so we can arrive at the perfect garden plan to know as we go in. And you know, if we're first timers this year, we're not necessarily maybe going to know, but as we track the these, you know, we know that we're going to have certain occurrences year after year. Um, we can start kind of nailing down and, and purging some of these issues. As far as biological controls, um, these can be hectic, um, 
effective, but they're just going to be hard to predict. So anytime uh, we have predatory insects, the seraphid wasp and things like that to lay on like hornworms, that's great, but we don't always know if we have that. That's again why creating that biodiverse ecosystem in our gardens is going to help because we've got um, a habitat that we're going to that's rich in diversity that we're going to draw in these beneficials that in turn are going to eat on these bad bugs which in turn especially if they're vectoring some of these diseases are going to reduce the occurrence of those diseases um, the trap plants if we know that cucumber wilt's going to be an issue um, you know i grow picklers i want to grow picklers for for pickling every year but if i grow some English cucumbers for whatever reason those um, cucumber beetles are going to go to that plant first and tend to leave alone my picklers. So kind of integrating some of those type um, systems in your garden is also going to help. So you're basically just planting a crop for them to go munch on. Chemical, uh, chemical control, um, you can see there from hardest to easiest. Again, viruses are going to be really hard to control. Um, fungal is going to be a lot easier to control. We got a couple of different ways that we can go with that. Protectant fungicides, because that's going to be applied before we need or before there's an infection, maybe even before we really even need protection. So they're going to have a broader activity spectrum. They're going to wash off a little bit quicker by rain and they're going to require shorter application um, intervals. If it's a penetrant, um, they're still going to be effective after infection, but they tend to have a narrow activity spectrum. They're going to hold a little bit more by rainfall and you're going to have a little bit longer time in between applications. Um, and again, when we were talking about chemicals, it's about protectant versus systemic, making sure that we're alternating um, the mode of action basically for these chemicals. Because you'll see there, um, protectants are going to have multi-site mode of action Penetrant's going to have a single site. And I'm going to get to this in just a few minutes so you'll see what I'm saying. But when we talk about um, sanitation or IPM, uh, again, I've already harped on this enough, but anytime you're pruning, make sure that you're disinfecting those pruners um, between cuts and remove any of that leaf litter that's har harboring any pathogen. And then just remove those, you know, rogue those plants, get those out of there. And I've talked a lot about this already. Um, fertilizing lime is directed. I'll have a lot of folks every year want to add just a little bit more fertilize. They want to push that growth. Don't do that. Um, you're going to get a lot of foliage, but you're not going to get a lot of fruit if you do that. Only go by what your soil test recommends. Um, same thing with chemicals. Go by that label. A little bit, dab more is actually going to do more harm than cure the problem. I promise. <laughs> Um, the easiest way to prevent disease is just use those resistant fruit and veggie um, cultivars. And then chemical control, that's always going to be our last step. You know, we're going to work with home gardeners and this is going to be the last step that we arrive at. Um, because again, fungicides prevent, they don't cure the disease. Um, we're going to utilize this when everything else that we've talked about has failed or it's just not going to be available. Um, sometimes we're going to apply these when conditions are going to favor disease development. So if we know we're getting ready to head into, uh, we planted tomatoes, they've been in the ground for three or four weeks and we're getting ready to enter into some pretty um, heavy rainfall for about four to five days, then we're going to be telling you, you probably want to get some Manzate or some kind of preventative control measure on those tomatoes to prevent maybe early blight from occurring, especially if we've already seen a couple of cases of that. So um, again, just remember, it's a, it's a last resort, but when we get to that point, we're, we usually mean it when we say, yeah, it's probably a good idea to go ahead and start spraying. And then again, rotating um, is going to be crucial just that mode of action. Now this um, you have available, it's in the Google Drive, it's on our web portal, portal. it's in multiple places. So you're gonna be able to nab this thing in a lot of different places where it's gonna be really handy for you. And I know this is really small because I don't have my glasses on either and I'm not gonna be able to read that very well. But what I like about this publication is that um, it's gonna give you the disease prevention and control materials. So it's gonna give you, um, like if you call my office and we get to talking about spraying 
preventatively for early blight. Um, I'm going to probably go ahead and say right out of the bat to apply uh, main cosette. This is going to be your active ingredient over here in the far left column. But for me, as an extension agent in Greene County and living in Washington County, I know that manzate and dithane are going to be available at our local farm and garden centers. Um, so I'm going to recommend what's pretty close. You're going to be able to get this though, no matter you know where you're at, at least one of these. But you're going to be able to see what diseases are going to be addressed by that. And then you can see here, the first thing it's going to tell you is that it's best used as a protectant. And it's going to give you some other comments. So um, if you are organic, we're going to have those organic chemicals that are going to be in this same publication. So we're, we've got those together. You're not going to have to go reach for multiple um, publications. You've got those there. Um, I also mentioned copper there a few minutes ago. So it's going to give you lots of different options to choose from because again, these may not all be available for all of us that's on the Zoom tonight. But you can see there anthrac anthracnose, alternaria, the mildews, um, early blight, you're going to get a lot of basically immune boosting benefits. That's kind of how I relate it. And you can see right here that it says it's organic. Same thing with neem oil. So it's going to tell you in this far corner if it is in fact organic. So this is a pretty new pub that we just come out with, um, I don't know, a few years ago, I guess. Darby and I were um, lucky enough to be a part of that. So this is a really cool publication. Let me see here. Yeah, the, you can see the, well, there's sulfur too. So you can see that it's organic. All of these three are. And I just took a couple of snapshots out of that to be able to show you what those were. Um, you also have this particular pub in the Google Drive as well. Oh my goodness, is it 7.30 already? What in the world happened? Okay, we'll run through these pretty quick. Um, so these are just some pictures of what some of these are going to look like. This is the Manco Zeb. Um, this is going to be um, the trade name or whatever made, made by Benad. Um, this is going to have the active ingredient Manzate in it. Um, this one here is going to be the Pro Stick. Manzate. This is what I purchased here. Um, this one you can usually get at box stores. This one you can get at like a co-op southern states or something like that. And this one bag will last you forever as long as you're keeping um, keeping it dry, keeping it stored properly. And then dithane. So you've got some different fungicide options there. Same thing here. Uh, Dacanil is going to have the active ingredient chlorothalonil. So if you hear your extension agent or whomever say chlorothalonil, that's the active ingredient. Dacanil is the trade name, and you're going to have options to choose from there. And you can kind of see some of these listed here. Um, here's where your copper and your lime sulfur and your garden sulfur come into play. All of these are going to be organic. Many different um, ways that these are going to look depending on where, where you live. Uh, Bacillus there in Genesis. Um, bacillus, uh, subtilis, neem, all of these organic compounds are, are going to be available, oftentimes even at um, box stores. But I tried to put pictures in there so you'd be able to kind of see what those looks like. Okay, so it is 730 and I was going to run into some bugs about some of these. So basically there'll be a slide that tells you what it is and how to control it and all that. And then you've got some pictures. I did just kind of want to mention this one, the Mexican bean beetle. So um, on your green beans, look for those egg casings and you can kind of see what that, whoa, what that life cycle looks like. And this is going to be a major issue and you can see that stippling and the chewing on the leaf there. Um, stink bugs, anytime they're a piercing insect. So you're going to get these little stipples. I don't know if you can see this very good here, but where they've actually, why is that doing that? Where they've actually pierced the skin and that can open us up to secondary infections. And there's your white fly. <laughs> um, usually you don't see these quite as prevalent in later in the season. You'll see those early season. Same way um, with the tomato and tobacco hornworms, but again if you get that um, biodiverse ecosystem created, then we're going to draw in those braconid wasps and cerephid wasps that are going to kind of munch on these, and that's pretty cool to have those. 
Squash vine borer, um, it's going to be much like the bacterial wilt and cucumbers. You're going to see them um, basically overnight. You can see the stem here uh, where he's actually going to be hibernating inside there. You can see the egg casings. Um, this plant would just need to be pulled and eradicate, rogue that plant out. But this is what the moth is going to look like here. So if you see this critter flying around, he's not beneficial. Um, that's a tough one to get rid of. And then kind of in tandem with that is the squash bug. You can see what those egg casings look like there and all the damage that they are going to um, incur. And you can see the different life stages, the little nymphs and everything here. They just keep growing and completely cover up your pumpkins and squashes and things. Um, any of your blister beetles, Harlequin bugs, they're pretty, but they can be a major issue. We liken those to the potato beetle. Um, for some reason, this is skipping ahead. I'm not doing that, y'all. <laughs> I don't know what it's doing. I've made it mad. It's like, shut up. It's time for everybody to go home. Uh, but this is the, the fruit worm. The, we can have this on tomato fruit worm or corn earworm, and they're going to be in the same family. This is um, one that is not very aesthetically pleasing, but you can typically cut those out if it becomes an issue. Um, controlling really in sweet corn in small quantities is going to be kind of hard to do, but um, oftentimes these are going to come in kind of as a secondary as well. I've already talked about the cucumber beetles. This is one that we'll start seeing pretty soon, um, the cabbage looper if we've not already. Uh, we'll see the diamondback moth or we'll see the white moth of the actual looper, but they're called the looper because they actually, like the inchworm, they loop along and they'll bury um, down into the heads of cabbage and broccoli and that's where they'll lay their eggs. So one of the best things you can do is actually cover those with like a floating row cover right now uh, when we see these flying around. That way they can't get in there and lay their larva. Um, and when you do pick any of those vegetables, just bring them in and soak them in salt water and that's going to cause these little critters to, to come on out. I told you all there was a lot of slides. We're not going to get anywhere near all these. Is there anything else anybody wants to know specifics about as I cruise through this? Because I don't want to keep you all much longer. If you want to unmute yourself and ask a question, that would be great. Here's one I do want to show you on bagworms. Um, most people want to control it when it gets to this stage, but right now is the time to be controlling um, bagworms, y'all, because they're just starting to emerge and they'll just start crawling right now, but you can kind of see what that damage looks like. And here's a picture of that bag. Yeah, because um, I didn't plan my timing exactly appropriately tonight, y'all. So again, I could be here talking till this time tomorrow, and I don't want to do that to y'all. So um, I'll go ahead and wrap wrap it up. But if you all have specific questions about anything we're co we covered, or if we didn't get to insects, um, feel free to put those in the chat box or ask right now if anybody wants to kind of linger for a little bit. Um, I know Darby's probably been working really hard on the chat box, so I'll make sure I get that out to everybody, but I hope you were able to at least maybe absorb some of that and kind of realize that we got a lot of options. A lot of it's just about being proactive and being preventative. Um, same thing with insects. I don't try to say that they're not as bad because they can be actually worse, but um, I think a lot of our issues, at least with what we see here in Northeast Tennessee, seems to be more driven by pathogens versus insects and a lot of those are being vectored by insects but let's see Darby's saying her internet glitched some so yes feel free to ask questions I really hate that I got off on the time tonight y'all but um, next week we're not going to be meeting live I'm going to have a pre-recorded video I'm going to do it sometime this week on growing root crops or potatoes and sweet potatoes so you'll get a little bit of the history behind the plant um, and, and just the different cultural methods to grow those. Some maybe pretty cool ideas if you want to grow potatoes and you've not got any planted in the ground yet. So uh, Kim is asking, will I do another program on the last half? I will tell you what I will do. Um, I'm going to, when I get all this synthesized and get the video uploaded, I will send you the video from insects from last year as well as 
I have a one hour class on just the insects and I have a one hour class on beneficial bugs. So y'all can watch um, at your leisure. There's a lot of content in there. Um, and then I may put together a little Flipgrid video to also send y'all next Monday just to kind of explain some of the highlights that I didn't get to pull out tonight that I wanted to share with you on the insects. But I'll make sure that you get all those links when I communicate with y'all tomorrow, okay? Great question. All right, guys. Well, I'm sorry I kept y'all longer than expected, but um, I will see y'all. Um, I haven't even looked at the May schedule yet. <laughs> Bad, but I know we'll be reconvening and I'll look at all that before I send you the communication tomorrow. So I'll be in touch and I will see you probably in two weeks, I'm thinking. So y'all have a good week. Enjoy the sunshine and garden on, y'all. Garden on. <laughs> see y'all. Thanks, Melody. Thank you.